Real quick before the video starts, this is actually part two of a two-part series. If you have not yet seen part one, head down to the description down below, click the first link, watch that, and then come back here when you're done. And now, without further ado, back to the madness. FNAF 4, the final chapter. God damn you, Scott. FNAF 4 is actually quite different from the other three that came before it because you're not in a pizzeria or a pizzeria-themed haunted house. You're in, well, well, a house. Just a house. Well, no, technically it takes place in a hospital, as you can tell by the IV drip and the, uh, the flowers that appear by your bed sometime. And the house is just sort of a hallucination because in this game, and this is actually pretty cool, you get to play as the victim of of the Bite of 87, aka this kid, the Crying Child. No, 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 not, not that Crying Child from FNAF 2 that went on to become the puppet. That is a separate, different, also murdered Crying Child. But this, not this one. This is a different, two different Crying Children here. We got what, we, they're, they're both crying, different reasons, not the same kid. Make sense? So the story of this kid takes place way back in the olden days of Fred Bear's family diner back when they still used to use the Springlock golden suits. We learn from everyone's favorite Atari-style minigames that it's this kid's birthday, and to celebrate, his family decided to take him out to Fred Bear's family diner way back in the old days when they still used to use the golden suits. Now apparently, this kid isn't having a great day because of, you know, the tears, probably because he is a logical human being, and he has to spend his birthday with some terrifying animatronics. Have you seen them? Who would not cry? But, unfortunately, as we all know, there is one force on this planet more evil than any other, and that is teenagers. So his older brother and all of his dumb friends decide to play a grand old prank on his younger brother on his birthday. They decide to grab him and shove his head into the golden freddy suit as it's performing <laughs> what a great prank right happy birthday kid now unfortunately remember what we learned about the golden spring lock suits way back in fnaf 3 yeah so this kid's tears caused the spring lock mechanisms in the jaws of the golden freddy suit to malfunction clamping down and crushing his skull he then is rushed to the hospital where he slowly and agonizingly dies while being haunted by the visions of the animatronics that terrified him so much in life. And you can buy a Golden Freddy plush for your child online for $10. In dying in literally the saddest way I can possibly think of, the spirit of this crying child, no, not that crying child from FNAF 2, that kid went on to become the puppet. This crying child goes on to possess the Golden Freddy suit that we saw all the way back in FNAF 1. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hold on, hold on a second. I thought we already knew who possessed the Golden Freddy suit. It was one of the random kids who got murdered that we heard about all the way back in the first game. And that is true, and hear me out because it gets a little bit complicated here, but the Golden Freddy suit is apparently haunted by not one, but two spirits. I guess uh, the suits are not picky about how many spirits they let in. They're like, yo, yeah, come on in, more the merrier. So, the reason the Golden Freddy suit is so much more powerful than the other ones in FNAF 1, because it can teleport around at will and stuff, is because it has the spirit of not only this crying child, no, not that crying child in it, but also the spirit of this kid named Cassidy, that we heard about that got murdered with the other five. Don't ask how we know the kid's name is Cassidy. I don't remember, and I don't care. I think it might have something to do with the crossword puzzle book. So actually, in a surprising twist, FNAF 4 is not nearly as complicated as the other games. We get to, you know, actually witness the Bite of 87, see the stuff that led up to it, and just sort of, you know, get some insight into one of the, uh, one of the oldest mysteries of this game. Okay, wait a second, wait a second. Didn't we say that it was an employee of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria that got bit, not a kid? And it was it was by Mangle, not one of the golden suits. That's why that's why the, the toys had to be dismantled before FNAF 1. And and in fact, the the golden suits should have been dismantled long before 1987 because they were too dangerous. 
Oh no, 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 no! Despite the fact that the bite of 87 has been an event that fans have been curious about since the very first game in the franchise, and this cutscene literally shows a kid being bit by one of the animatronics, this is not the victim of the bite of 87, this is the victim of the bite of 83, a completely unseen and to this point unmentioned event in the game's franchise. Why? Oh, uh, so the bite of 83 is what finally causes the Springlock suits to be decommissioned for good. Hooray, I guess. As for who this crying child is, no, not that crying child, this crying child, or his older brother for that matter, we have no idea. Oh, and also, you remember Phone Guy and Phone Dude that we were asking about? Well, they don't appear in this game at all, and as far as I can tell, they are never seen or mentioned for the rest of the franchise. Hooray. Oh yeah, and this game also famously ends with a locked box that, no matter what you do, you can't open. Don't get your hopes up. After the release of the supposed final chapter, the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise began to expand beyond your regular uh, point-and-click style horror games. FNAF World was kind of a bizarre, uh, quirky RPG type of game, but also uh, Scott himself has said that it is not canon, and that means I do not have to talk about it. Also, I know I promised I would not talk about any of the books, and believe me, I really, really do not want to, but the first tie-in series of novels, starting with The Silver Eyes, does give us some useful information for the story at large. Namely, the name and identity of Purple Guy. Yeah, that's right, the identity of our main child murdering antagonist that we've been wondering about this whole time is revealed in a freaking book. William Afton, not only our Fandango fellow child murdering main antagonist throughout this whole series so far, but also the man responsible for designing and manufacturing all of the animatronics that the Freddy Fazbear's franchise has used from the very beginning. That's right, folks. It wasn't just bad engineering. It was bad guy engineering. And also, most of it was still pretty bad. Oh yeah, and uh, apparently in this book, William also has a business partner named Henry Gale. That's not actually his last name. I don't know or care if he has a real last name. I've just been watching a lot of Lost recently. We don't know much about Henry besides the fact that he, I guess, doesn't like to murder children. So, you know, props, I guess. But uh, aside from that, he doesn't really do much for a while. But keep him in mind, because he'll be back. Alright, but that's enough about reading. Books are for chumps. Let's get back to the game. Just kidding, kids. Reading is great, and I promise you never have to enter someone's phone number into some stone wall tiles to understand the story. It's great. Right, so I had to do a little bit of rearranging to fit FNAF 5 in here, but uh, everything should still be good, should still make sense, so let's go. Turns out, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was not the final chapter in the Five Nights at Freddy's saga. It was the final numbered chapter because Five Nights at Freddy's 5 is actually just called Sister Location. This game is set in between 1983 and 1987, or as I like to call it, the Betwixt Bites era. This game is actually not about a Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria at all, but rather a spin-off restaurant that opened up at the height of the Freddy Fazbear popularity called Circus Baby's Pizza World. Our old friend William Afton, aka probably not actually Purple Guy, maybe he just likes to wear purple shirts? I don't know, I was never really clear on that. He is brought back into the fray to design a completely new line of animatronics for this new restaurant, the mascot of which is, of course, Circus Baby. Because you know what's less scary than a big golden bear that'll chop your head off if you cry too much? Clowns! Everything at Circus Baby's Pizza World was going spectacularly until, you know, the first day they opened when a little girl accidentally got too close to Circus Baby and a claw shot out of her torso, grabbed the little girl, and yanked her into her body, killing her instantly. 
Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, this new line of animatronics were called the Fun Time animatronics. Fun indeed. At this point, obviously, the authorities promptly arrested William Afton for clearly designing these robots for the express purpose of murdering children and disposing of the evidence. He went to jail and was never seen nor heard from again. Just kidding, he goes uninvestigated and unquestioned for the entirety of the franchise and the Fazbear restaurants continue to commission animatronics from him for decades to come. The owners of the new Circus Baby Pizza World now had a very important question to answer. What to do with all of these robots that were clearly designed in order to murder children? Continue renting them out to children's birthday parties? Yeah, that seems perfectly safe. Because clearly, the thing that was wrong with the original pizza restaurant was the pizza. And thus, Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rentals was born. Basically, just a warehouse where they store all the Funtime animatronics in between birthday party rentals. And of course, this warehouse has a nighttime security guard. Is this Groundhog's Day? Am I Bill Murray? Do, do I have to find the meaning of life before I can move on from this? I'll do it. I will do it. I will, I'll do that right now. I'll be right back. Throughout the course of the game, Baby, now possessed by the spirit of the girl that she murders, tries to befriend you and eventually lures you to a room in the back where she and the other Funtime animatronics... You know what? I'm not even going to try and sugarcoat this. They use a machine to scoop all of your internal organs out through your throat and then replace them with this guy, Ennard, who's basically an amalgamation of all the fun time animatronics so that they can escape wearing you like a skin suit. God damn! In a rare Atari style minigame that flashes forward instead of back, we see that their plan was successful and this guy entered, uh, has been walking around in your body for a while until it starts to rot and turn purple, at which point he pieces out. By some miracle though, even though you have no internal organs, this guy survives and can continue walking around living his life like usual. I got nothing. At a quick glance, it seems like FNAF 5 pretty much sits on its own. Show us some of the past works of Willy Goat's Gruff, kind of expand the world a little bit, maybe set up Ennard as a future antagonist moving forward. Nothing too crazy. But what if I told you that FNAF 5 contains some of the biggest lore reveals that completely reframes and retcons the entire story as we know it? Do you remember that girl who got killed by Baby? That was William Afton's daughter. And do you remember the crying child? No, not that. You know the drill at this point? The one that got killed by Golden Freddy and that we play as in FNAF 4? His son. But what if I told you that that is not the only Afton we get to play as in this series. The crying child's older brother, the one in the foxy mask right here. His name is Michael Afton, and he just so happens to be the same guy that we play as in FNAF 5, the one who will later go on to get scooped and then become quite literally a purple guy. Not the purple guy, that's his father, William Afton, who, as far as I can tell, is not actually purple, although, again, at this point, nothing would surprise me. But the rabbit hole doesn't stop there. Oh, rabbit's hole. Oh, don't remind me. Oh! You ready? Here's the big twist. FNAF 5 is not the only game where we get to play as Michael Afton. In fact, with the exception of FNAF 4, where we play as this kid, we've been playing as Michael Afton the whole time. Mike Schmidt, Fritz, the unnamed security guard from FNAF 3, it's been Michael all along. Taking a job at any Freddy's establishment he could, trying to atone for the sins of his father, being hunted by the animatronics because he looks too much like his father who murdered all of them, and being fired for odor because he is quite literally a walking, rotting corpse. And it all comes to a head in FNAF 3, where father and son are reunited at last. It's Michael versus Springtrap. 
versus William Afton once and for all. It's not faulty wiring, but Michael himself who sets Fazbear Frights ablaze, sending his father straight to hell once and for all. What a twist! What an ending! What a series! There's still four more. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. No, not a fan game, not some weird FNAF world style spin-off. This is the official Five Nights at Freddy's 6 game. I genuinely never knew it existed. Luckily, we already know the entire Afton family tree. We know all the complicated openings and closings of the many Fazbear restaurants and spin-offs and haunted houses and all that junk. So this one is actually pretty straightforward. It sits all the way at the very end of the timeline. Everything that has happened already happened. At this point, Michael has done his best to set free almost all of the spirits still within the animatronics. The FNAF 1 animatronics we saw dismantled by Papa Willie himself. He inadvertently set all the spirits free, chased them into the room, got turned into the cereal kebab. We all know the story. The toy animatronics from FNAF 2, they were all dismantled after the bite of 87. We knew that before FNAF 1 they weren't around anymore, so they're all good. So all that leaves is Baby, who, let's be honest, at this point has seen better days. Ennard, who I guess decided to get a facelift and is now Molten Freddy? Sure, why not? There's also the puppet. Remember that guy from FNAF 2 who was possessed by the crying child? Yes, that crying child from the FNAF 2 minigame? William Afton's first ever victim? Yeah, well, they're a bear too for... I don't... I could not tell you at this point, nor do I care. Oh, and also, how could we forget Springtrap? What? Yup, somehow Willie Joel survived the climax of FNAF 3, the epic battle between him and his son, and is still kicking around. How you ask? Well, I'm glad you ask. Do you remember Cassidy, that one spirit that got uh, killed by William way back uh, here and went on to possess, be one of the spirits inside the Golden Freddy suit along with the crying child? No, not that crying child, the, his son, the crying child who is from, uh, here. That kid. Um, so apparently Cassidy is pretty bummed about getting serial killed, and they have decided to make it their mission to keep William alive eternally and torture him until the end of time. Why does this seemingly random kid have the power to do that? I don't know. So that's four possessed murder bots still on the loose, one of which has the body of a known child serial killer still inside. And that leaves Michael with the important question. What do? Luckily, our old friends from the books, Henry, still don't know his last name, I'm gonna call him Henry Gale, is back into the fray. And guess what? We learn a bit more about Henry in this book too. Namely, that the crying child, yes, that crying child, that was Henry's child, daughter, son. I'm not entirely sure which one. I'm not going to look it up. It was his kid, and now Henry wants revenge on William. I don't know what he's been doing the rest of this time. It took him 20, 30 years to get revenge. Maybe he was a busy guy. So Michael and Henry team up to build a brand new Freddy's restaurant. I know what you're thinking. The first five went so well, but this one is actually just a ruse, a fake, Quite literally, a Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria simulation. I see what you did there. I get it now. Designed to lure in all of the remaining animatronics. Now, whether all the animatronics have some sort of psychic link to any building with the Freddy's name, or they just saw hashtag Freddy's back trending on Twitter or something, is unclear. But nonetheless, come they do. After trapping all of the animatronics inside the building and delivering an epic ending monologue, they set this new Fazbear's Pizzeria ablaze, setting free the souls of Baby, Molten Freddy, and Lefty, aka Henry's daughter, and setting them free once and for all. Now all that's left is purple springtrap William Guy Afton himself. His spirit is still being kept alive by Cassidy, who wants to seek eternal revenge, but at this point, his body is a twice-baked rabbit, and he is not a threat to anyone any longer. 
FNAF 7, aka Ultimate Custom Night, is basically just the Smash Bros of the Freddy's universe, and it's not really adding anything to the story, it's just William Afton being eternally tormented by Cassidy with uh, visions of all of the wicked creations that he made throughout his life. And there you have it. After seven long games, finally, this story is complete. All of the animatronics have been dealt with. William Afton is not a threat to anyone anymore. All of the loose ends have been addressed. All of the questions have been answered. Just don't, just, uh, just ignore, ignore that guy. Oh, uh, yeah, these guys, just don't, don't worry about, uh, uh, like, like I said, all of the questions have been answered, and the story is complete. There are two more games. Oh, I've been recording for almost six hours. Please, just be done with me, FNAF. Just let me go. Just let me go! Alright, Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted set all the way at the end of our timeline. In this virtual reality game, we learn that there was a rogue indie developer in the FNAF universe who uh, was inspired by all the, uh, you know, the dark stories and all the murders that happened at all the Freddy's restaurants and uh, was inspired to develop a series of short form horror games about Five Nights at Freddy's. What? Now, I know what you're thinking and no. This is not a reference to all of these games that we have already previously played. These games, FNAF 1 through 6 or 7, do not exist within the Five Nights at Freddy's universe. This rogue indie developer has created a completely separate series of short form horror games based on Freddy's that we have never seen. Now, in retaliation, the Fazbear franchise, which I guess is still around? I thought they were supposed to have gone out of business at the end of FNAF 1, and that's why these random people were able to open a haunted house with the Freddy's name in FNAF 3, but I, I guess they're still here. I don't, I don't care anymore. I don't care. So, in retaliation to this rogue indie developer giving them all this bad press that they totally don't deserve, right? I mean, what's a, a couple dozen dead kids? Come on. So in retaliation, they decide to create their own video game, sort of poking fun at the uh, at all the accusations, all the stories, kind of reclaiming them. This is a VR game entitled Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted. And this game, this VR game, actually is this game right here that we can play in real life. So all of these other games that we can play in real life do not exist within the FNAF universe. There's a separate series of games similar that exist within the universe, but not these. However, Help Wanted exists both within our universe and the FNAF universe. I don't understand where the confusion is. I don't, it's, it's pretty simple. Now I know what you're thinking. The end of FNAF 6 did away with the last of the animatronics. There's no more besides Willie Mapton who's, you know, kind of being tortured or whatever. I don't know what's up with him. Who could possibly be the villain for this game? William Afton Arnim Zola'd himself. He went full Winter Soldier on us and he Arnim Zola'd himself. I don't know when this happened, I don't know how, sometime in the 80s or the 90s, William Afton put his consciousness onto a hard drive on a random uh, computer in the Freddy Fazbear's in a random restaurant. And, uh, that's it. I don't know. I don't, I don't understand. Why? Why? Somehow, when developing this horror game right here, this VR horror game made by the people at the Fazbear's restaurant, somehow that bit of code with William Afton's consciousness in it got put into the game. So they found a hard drive from like 30 years ago with some weird code on it that they didn't understand and they thought, yeah, let's just throw it in the game. Let's just, let's put it right in there. And that manifested itself as this guy, Glitchtrap, right here, who is the digital recreation 
of the soul of William Afton or his memories or something. And it's a golden rabbit, even though at the time that he put his consciousness in the computer, presumably he wasn't a rabbit yet because that happened uh, uh, here. And the Arnim Zola thing happened somewhere in here. So I don't know. I don't understand. That should be the title of this video. I don't understand. But, folks, it gets even better. So, apparently, some of the people who were playtesting this game, which I guess is also you, like the real-life person, you're supposed to be like a playtester for this game, when playing the game, they met this guy in-game, Glitchtrap, that's what he's called. They call him Glitchtrap, Springtrap, ah, uh -huh, very clever. They met him, and then he, this, his digital spirit possessed their real-life bodies? Like the second and third Matrix movies that everyone hated? I just... Oh! Oh! Uh, yeah, so there was some uh, Pokemon Go knockoff, I guess, of FNAF that I never heard of, apparently. Uh, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, and in that, we can read, like, emails or something, where we learned that people were... Uh, a couple of people got mind-controlled by this guy, this glitch trap, William Afton, dude, whatever. And one of those people was Vanny. Voral? Vanny? I don't care. Uh, she put on a white rabbit suit, uh, and that is the main antagonist of Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. A random woman who got mind-controlled by the digital recreation of the consciousness of our main villain that he made way back in the 80s. Oh! And as you can see, once you have all of the puzzle pieces in place, the story really isn't all that complicated. Sure, there are some parts where, you know, it's very interconnected. Other parts, uh, you know, were not so much. But, at its core, it is just a story about family drama, murder, revenge, and robot mind control. On the very off chance that you have spotted any inaccuracies with this timeline, please do me a favor and don't tell me. Just keep it to yourself. I Just let me be free. Just let me be free. Oh, I'll see you guys in the next video where I'm not talking about any of this. And for the love of God, take it easy. Robot mind control, Scott. Really? Robot mind control. <laughs>